And Lord, as we now turn our hearts and our minds towards your word, uh, we ask that in this place, each of us might be connected with you in a way that shapes our lives, that we might go and live in service to others. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So part three of our walk through the book of Nehemiah in the Make It Count summer series. If you want to grab your Bibles, um, we're on pages in the Red Bibles 439 to 442. I had to tell you those numbers right now because I was going to forget them later. So I told you 439 to 442 if if you want to look in the Red Bibles under the seat in front of you. Otherwise, Book of Nehemiah chapters 4 and 6. So last week, like I said, last week we talked about um, how we can so often waste our time or our money and or our energy, but instead of wasting it, we want to spend it in order to make it count. And I'll be honest, last week um, I got a lot of response from people about the sermon. A a lot of people came up and talked to me afterwards. Um, I got a number of emails, and there just seemed to be a really high engagement, particularly on the topic of carburetors. We have a lot of great small engine mechanics in here that I really should have called. And a couple of you said, Carl, you should have called me. I would have solved your problem for you. Uh, So it's just good to know people are paying attention and listening to the sermons and thinking about it and figuring out how you can apply your lives to the things I'm talking about really warms my heart, really (laughs) warms my heart. Um, So we're continuing the story of Nehemiah. And today is opposition Sunday. Very happy, lighthearted term. It's all about how when we prayerfully figure out our priorities in life and we let those create some plans, we should assume that there will be opposition. We should assume that because we see that in the story of Nehemiah. We see that actually in lots of stories. And quite frankly, we see that in our own lives. So I just want to get your head into opposition. When I think of opposition, I think about summer camp. Now, I think about summer camp most of the time, so maybe that's not abnormal, but here's what came to my mind. I remember playing what we called wide area games. You guys have probably experienced things like this. Hundreds of kids, huge field or in northern Minnesota, forest, and we're all running around like crazy trying to catch one another or capture a flag or do something like that. One of the games at my summer camp was called Wells Fargo, and it was very simple. I start on my side of, of the field, and I get money, and I want to get to the bank on the other side, and I want to put my money in the bank. They were subliminally teaching us good saving habits, I think. So I, I, I take my money, and I need to get across to the other side, and I need to get it into the bank. And whichever team gets more money into the other bank wins. But you guys know how this goes, right? There's the bank's in the middle of a huge field, So I'm running along, and there's all of the other team that's trying to capture me and stop me from getting my money into the bank. Now, I was either a very clever boy, or I just knew that I wasn't fast enough to run away from everybody. So what I did was I actually snuck along the edge of the field where there was a forest, and actually the forest went down to the lake, and you could sneak down by the lakeside, And you could just like jump up from behind the bank and run in and avoid all of that chasing. So that was my plan. And it worked. But it really was, it was a little anticlimactic. Because the whole point of the game is to run and to face all of your opponents. And I remember Russ Barkley. You guys don't know Russ Barkley. But I remember watching Russ Barkley. And he would just sort of swagger out onto the field. And he'd get down in his ready to prance stance. And I would watch him zigzag and weave and spin his way around all of the opponents and apparently effortlessly waltz into the bank every time. And I always remember thinking to myself, I wish I could avoid and weave and dodge and get past my opponents like Russ Barkley could because all the real glory shows up when you can. What am I doing here? There we go. All the glory is one not when you sneak around the back, but when you can face your opponents head on and get past them. And I think 
that might even be a metaphor for life, when we in life are trying to live with purpose, not just wander along with the winds that the world would uh, blow us around, but we want to live with some sort of purpose, we want to live with a purpose that when we face opposition, we don't back down, we don't give in, we don't have to throw, our, throw in the towel, but rather we can navigate, we can even overcome the opponents that stand in front of us. And that's what we're going to see in the life of Nehemiah. But first, I want to ask you, where in your life would you say you're facing some opposition right now? I mean, think about your life. Maybe think particularly, this whole sermon is kind of on the assumption that we have prayerfully determined some priorities in our life and that that's the way our life is trying to go. I'm just assuming that we are living our lives according to the way God wants us to live. If you're not doing that, I'd invite you to think about it. Try it. Try it on for size. It's a good idea. But the the sermon's on that assumption because if you're doing that, then there's probably some opposition. So where in your life are you facing opposition? What does it look like? If it's a person in this room, don't look at them right now. Just don't that's okay. Uh, if it's me, then that's convenient. You can look at me, and then nobody will know the difference. I don't think it's me. You never know. Um, but we want to think about where are we trying to go with our lives? What's standing in the way? And then the ultimate question, obviously, is what do we do? What do we do in the face of it? Um, okay, so brief review. Where we've been so far in the book of Nehemiah. Here's the big story. God chooses a people, the Jewish people, and he says, I'm going to bless you But I'm not going to bless you just for no reason. I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to all people. But God's people who were blessed run into some hard times. And they go into what is referred to as the exile. And it was an exile to Persia. The Persian Empire comes in and conquers God's people, which makes them very sad. And not only conquers them, but burns down their city, Jerusalem, and carts them off to the foreign country. Well, the exile comes to an end, and the Jewish people are now able to come back to Jerusalem, and that's where we are in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which actually go together in one book, but we're just looking at the second half. And the books of Ezra and Nehemiah tell the story this way. The first group of God's people come back to Jerusalem, and a guy named Zerubbabel, I just like, I just, I want to say that word often, Zerubbabel. That's a great word. He comes back with the first contingent of the Jewish people, and he rebuilds the temple. The temple was the center of the Jewish people's social life, economic life, and of course their religious life, their connection to God. And then after comes Ezra, he brings more people back to Jerusalem, and he says, okay, we have a temple, but now we shouldn't just have a temple, we should worship our God. So Ezra leads revival among the people. And that brings us then to Nehemiah, the third leader, who comes back with a third group of Jews. And he says, okay, we've got a temple, But the wall around our city, which is necessary because lots of other places would like to come with an army and capture Jerusalem. Um, If you don't have a wall, you really don't have a city. So Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls. Now, let's just, I mean, let's just kind of get our heads and our hearts into this moment. Picture with me. You are now a Jew living in Jerusalem at this time. In your recent memory, you know that your parents and grandparents had lived in exile, away from their home country, out of Jerusalem. This is very close in your mind, and you're part of this group of people that has now just returned to Jerusalem. You've just returned. And there's this man named Nehemiah who's leading this very exciting time in the life of God's people. There's energy, there's movement. Nehemiah has clearly spoken God's desires for God's people. And if you read, we kind of skipped over chapter three. If you read chapter three, A, it's kind of boring because all it is is a list of names of people that rebuilt sections of wall. And it's kind of boring. But Go read it anyway, because underneath the boring, chapter 3 is this incredible statement about how apparently the entire city was so moved, was so committed, was so energized that the entire city came out to rebuild the wall. We know how hard it is to get a small group of people to all move in the same direction, doing the same thing. So now we've got these exiles who have just come back 
They're kind of just reestablishing. They're trying to figure out, how am I going to eat and put food on the table? How are we going to grow some crops and feed some animals? Everything is sort of brand new, unstable, unfamiliar. And yet still, Nehemiah manages to get all of them working together to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah is incredibly uh, compelling as a leader. He is an incredibly compelling leader. And yet, right at that moment, and actually three different times during this rebuilding effort, we find in the story that Nehemiah and all of the Jews face opposition. And they're facing opposition from the other people groups, the other um, kind of kingdoms in the area, who don't like that there's a new people coming back into town and rebuilding their city wall. So we're going to look at three of the scenes, three of the passages that describe the opposition that Nehemiah faces. Um, We're going to consider whether or not we ever see the same type of opposition in our own lives, because quite often what happens um, in a story like Nehemiah, in a story from scriptures, what we see them experiencing then quite significantly mirrors what we might be experiencing now in our own lives. So we're going to consider the opposition they faced, and then we're just going to ask ourselves, what can we learn from that story? Okay, so we're there. We're in ancient Jerusalem. There's this massive construction project underway. God's people are energized. They're excited. They're moving in the same direction. It's this huge sort of public works project. That's where we're at. Um, And here is Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through three. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stone. Which is funny. I mean, this is like humor right there in the Bible. So um, the word I want to highlight is he ridiculed the Jews. The very first thing, this construction project is just starting, right? It's just getting underway. They apparently have started building, but the wall is still low, and it makes Tobiah go, oh, a fox could knock the thing over. It's so pathetic of a project. And what strikes me is this. Isn't it common that right when you start moving in a new direction, right when you feel like there's some momentum, isn't it common that there's going to be a voice of ridicule that says, what you're doing is foolish. I'm betting you've experienced that in your own life. And one of the other things that it made me realize is not only is it common for there to be a voice of ridicule, but at least for me sometimes, it's common when that voice is actually my own. I mean, have you ever had that experience where you feel like, oh man, Maybe, maybe in prayer, God gave me something I'm excited about and I'm moving in a new direction, or maybe just life in general. You say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. I'm going to kind of put a stake in the ground and I'm going to set out to do something. And the very next thought in your own mind is, oh, how foolish. You're never going to succeed. You're never going to get that happen. Or if not in your own mind, because you've got the health to not do that, somebody in your life speaks out and ridicules you. Sure enough, That was the first thing that Nehemiah encountered. And for me, at least, it's a very common human experience. But unfortunately for Nehemiah, it didn't stop there. The project continues. The project actually moves very quickly. The energy and the momentum continue. Apparently, the ridicule of these enemies didn't stop the rebuilding of the wall, but it continued. So again, in chapter 6, starting in verse 1, we hear opposition number Two, when word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Okay, pause for a second. 
We're going to get to the message. And a few people asked, and I figure I might as well say, so Tobiah, that's my son's name, he's clearly a bad guy, right? He's a bad guy character. <laughs> Why would I name my son Tobiah? <laughs> okay, not because of this. The name Tobiah in Hebrew means God is good. So we just, we just stick with the whole God is good part, and we sort of brush aside this guy. This is the only Tobiah in the whole Bible. <laughs> I digress. Um, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. An innocent little message, but Nehemiah sees through it. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Reasonable answer. Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time Sanballat sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand mm -hmm, was an unsealed letter, which is, that's a big deal. That's like clue, big deal in which was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now, this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. You have to read it in that voice in order to really get the... I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. Again, I feel like we could make a play and like the lines would be written already and it would be great. So, so Nehemiah has come back to Jerusalem and Nehemiah knows that God has chosen a people and God wants to bless the people so that the people can be a blessing to others. And when you read through the Old Testament, you see time and time again, God calling his people to take care of the foreigner and the fatherless and the widow, to leave behind part of their crop, 10% for those who cannot grow a crop so that they can eat. We see time and time again, these instructions, God is blessing his people so that his people might bless others. That's what Nehemiah is trying to do in rebuilding Jerusalem. But Sanballat is making up this story and being like, hey, I'm going to spread rumors about how you're trying to take over the kingdom of Persia. And if I spread those rumors, Persia's going to come back and beat you up again. That's what Sanballat's trying to be. And what does Nehemiah do? He looks straight at Sanballat. He doesn't look at him. This is a letter. But we can imagine. The play would be better if they were looking at each other. He looks right at Sanballat and he says, you're making this up. Basically, Nehemiah says, okay, you're scheming against me, right? You're scheming against me, and you're trying to make up lies and spread rumors, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to make up lies to get me to act based on the lies instead of acting based on what God has called me to do. And Nehemiah sees right through it. He says, no, I'm not going to listen to your silly lies. That was opposition number two. But opposition number three comes at the end, and this one's a little more, uh, in a sense, mundane. The wall has been completely finished. The gates have been set in place. Nehemiah and God's people successfully navigated attempt number one and attempt number two to, to, to ruin their plans. And here's how the story starts to wrap up. When all our enemies heard about this, the completion of the wall, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was son-in-law to Shekaniah, son of Arah. I know you guys knew that, but they wanted to make sure you knew that he was the son-in-law. Um, and his son Jehohanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me 
his good deeds, and then telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. So, we said opposition number one was the voices that ridicule the plan, whether voices from the outside or sometimes voices from the inside. Opposition number two was scheming, sometimes lies, sometimes active defiance to try and ruin the plans. And then the third, the project has been completed, but still what they're trying to do is say, okay, sure you completed it, but I'm gonna intimidate you. My guess is hopefully to make it seem like even though you accomplished the project, to make you second guess whether or not it was actually good work. And isn't that true? Sometimes you finish a project. You get where you think you're going. You've said, God, I think you're sending me this direction. I'm going to go this direction. And you get to the end and you go, oh man, was that even the right thing to do? Oh shoot, did it, did it, did it get done as well as I wanted? Oh man, or somebody else maybe puts those questions in your mind and makes you try to second guess whether or not you've done the right thing. So, three types of opposition. I just want to offer now, and, and this is, you can fill in the blanks in your programs for this if you want. I just want to offer now my three observations from this story. What do we do in our own lives when we face opposition? So first of all, um, the first experience was ridicule. Try to think for a second. When, where have you been ridiculed? When and where have you heard a voice saying, you're not gonna do it, you don't have what it takes, you can't get it done, that's a silly idea. When and where have you faced ridicule? I think the story of Nehemiah says that the presence of opposition, simply because that voice is speaking against you, simply because it exists, it's present in your life, the presence of opposition doesn't demand a change in plans. The really interesting thing is that when Nehemiah was ridiculed, do you know what he did? He kept doing what he was already doing. And that's indeed the challenge. When the voices come from our own heads or from the, from the world around us and they say, what you're doing is silly, we have to ask ourselves, whose voice am I really listening to? Am I doing this because I listened to the voice of God and God told me to do it? And if so, I don't care what that other voice says. If it's a voice of an opponent who's just ridiculing me, I shouldn't care. The presence of opposition doesn't mean we change the plans. So the second opposition came along, and it wasn't just a voice. It wasn't just making fun or ridiculing or question. The second opposition was an actual scheme is the word that was used. Have you ever felt, maybe you've even heard somebody say this, or maybe you've even said it yourself. I just feel like the world is out to get me. I just feel like the world is scheming against me. I mean, have you guys ever seen that, heard that, been there? Like you look around and it just feels like everywhere you look, something new is coming up and standing in your way and trying to get you down. Again, what did Nehemiah do when the world was scheming against him? He simply continued on the plan that he felt God had given him. When the world schemes against you, you double down on your priorities. If we're living our lives because we've prayerfully figured out our priorities in life, if we're doing that, then when the world schemes against you, what do you do? You keep even greater focus on the priorities and do not get distracted from what's all around. And then, last but not least, there was sort of this this like last ditch effort by the enemies to ruin the plan or make them think it wasn't as great as it was. Um, and we're going to get to the rest of the story after this. But my final sort of observation is persistent opposition, right? The problems keep coming up and they keep coming back. Even when you successfully finished your work, the opposition still shows up. Persistent opposition is not an indicator, sorry, persistent opposition is an indicator of progress, not failure, right? We're sometimes tempted to think, oh man, all these problems keep showing up. Maybe it's because I'm doing the wrong thing. No, problems show up because we live in a world full of problems. If we've set out to do the right thing in the first place, then the presence of persistent op opposition simply means we're still 
moving forward. It doesn't mean we failed. So what do we do with all this? What does this look like, uh, Carl? None of that was really tips or tricks for how to um, get through it. Rather, all of that, as I was thinking about it, um, as I kind of kept reading through the text and going, what is this really saying? Here's what all of that does. It's all focused on helping us see clearly. And I think that seeing clearly from this story, seeing clearly is actually the most important thing for us to be able to do if we're going to be following God's plans for our lives and having the discipline to continue even in the face of opposition. And as I was thinking about seeing clearly, sort of a closing story came to mind. Um, I was reading a book and it was talking about, the author was talking about um, the Korean War. And he was talking about, um, specifically this author was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, and so he was talking about what he had learned about fighter pilots in the Korean War. Now, I'm not a Korean War expert, so if I get some of the details wrong, I apologize, but the story, I think, holds true. Here's how it goes. In the Korean War, there were two major, um, two two, kind of air-to-air combat planes that were involved in the Korean War. There was the Russian-built MiG-15, and then there was the American plane, the F-86. Some of you are nodding your heads like you know these things, so okay, I'll take courage in that. Now, the MiG-15, as this author tells, was faster, was more maneuverable, and had a better thrust to weight ratio. I don't know what that means, but he seemed to think it was a big deal. Yeah, okay, that's probably what it means. It means (laughs) The F-86 was slower, was less maneuverable, and had a lesser thrust to weight ratio. So if you were to just put these two planes side by side on paper, you would assume, man, in the Korean War, the Americans just, the skies were wiped clean of the American planes. However, the data was that the MiGs were shot down at a 10 to 1 ratio. For every one American plane that was shot down, for every one of the slower, less maneuverable planes, for every one that was shot down, 10 of the faster, better planes were shot down. And so this author shares a story about a a pilot in the Korean War who fought some missions and came home from the Korean War and found himself scratching his head and going, why in the world were the faster, better planes shot down so much more often? Well, this guy, uh, he ended up becoming a a flight instructor for the armed forces and teaching fighter pilots. And as a flight instructor, he had time to think about this conundrum from his experience in the World War. So he started doing research. Okay, how do we experience this discrepancy? Is it that the Americans were just so much better trained? Ah, You know, maybe, but that wouldn't account for 10 times the higher kill rate? Is it that we had better tactics? We had a better understanding of air-to-air combat? And again, he, he did the research and he said, no, that just doesn't account for as big of a discrepancy. And finally, this Air Force instructor said, I think I know what it was. The American F-86 had a cockpit that was a single dome of glass. The MiG, on the other hand, the cockpit was made out of a number, I think it was six panes of glass that were connected by these steel rods. What that means is when the American pilots tried to look around, they could see everything around them, an unobstructed view of everything around the plane. When the other pilots looked around, they could see clearly here and then see a big steel bar, and then they could see clearly here and then see a big steel bar, and then they could look clearly here and then see a big steel bar. And so this guy's conclusion was, the reason the American planes shot down the others at a 10 to one ratio is because the American pilots could see more clearly and therefore respond more immediately and quickly to what was around them. And that ability to see and respond quickly is what made the critical difference. So 
So if that illustration proves true, and we're trying to make it count this summer, then here's my question. As you're looking at your life right now, right, and, and we've all got different things going on in our lives. You're, you're looking at your work, and you're looking at your family, and you're looking at your friendships, and you're looking at not, not just those sort of details, but you're saying, what, what am I really here for? What am I really trying to do? And hopefully, you're looking at that all saying, God, what do you have for me to do in this life? Then here's my challenge. As you're looking at that all, and as opposition comes your way, be sure that you see clearly enough to name the opposition for what it is. Namely, not the voice of God. Not the thing shaping your direction. But rather, an obstacle in the way that with the help of God, like Nehemiah and like the lives of so many Christ followers around the world through history, an opposition that is in your way and is an opportunity for you and God to overcome and therefore glorify what God is doing that much more. I'm going to have the worship team come back up, and would you guys pray with me? God, I don't know what everyone in this room is thinking about when we think about the opposition standing in front of us, but I can imagine a lot of different things. I can imagine that there might be physical health or illness that feels like it's standing in the way. I can imagine that there might be some relational difficulties, some tension, some, some broken relationships that feel like they're distracting us or pulling us away from what you have for us. I imagine that maybe there's confusion or uncertainty. People wondering, what is it, God, that you actually are calling me to? So God, my prayer for me and my prayer for every one of us is this. Grant us, Lord, a clarity to see where you are leading us. Grant us a clarity to see where you are leading each of us in our own lives, and God, grant us a clarity as a church to see where you are leading us together. And may that ability to see clearly help us overcome whatever obstacles stand in our way. Amen.